Hi, this is Laura Irvin, and I am here today to talk to you about thermal energy, heat, and temperature. Our subjects today will be types of energy, law of conservation of energy, that should be a little bit of a review, kinetic molecular theory, how do we measure energy, let's talk about how energy moves from one place to another, and hopefully we'll have time to do a few practice problems. So to get started, let's do a review about the different types of energy there are. And first of all, it's important to understand that when we're talking about energy, we're talking about something that has the potential or the ability to do work. So there should be a couple of different types of energy that you've discussed in your classes. One type of energy is potential energy. Potential energy is anything that has the potential to do work. It's what we would call stored energy or energy of position. So what do we mean by that? Energy of position would be what we're talking about when we're discussing gravitational potential energy. You may have done calculations like PE, the potential energy is equal to gravity, times the height, times the mass of whatever object it is you're looking at that's above the Earth. The higher the object, the more gravitational potential energy something has. Um, you may or may not have looked at chemical energy. That's the energy stored in chemical bonds. And if you haven't, you're probably gonna look at that pretty uh, quickly. Elastic potential energy, you know if you stretch a rubber band, then you let go of it, it's gonna snap back, and that would be movement or work. And so springs and elastic have um, potential energy. Voltage, energy stored in batteries. This is kind of, in a way, related to chemicals, um, but voltage is just looking at the potential of electrons to move from one place to another, and they have what they call electromotive force, and they can do work for us in our cell phones, in our flashlights, when we put a battery in there. So voltage is another way we can store energy. Can you think of any others, or have you discussed any other types of potential energy in your classes? Okay, so what we really are gonna focus on is not the energy of position or potential energy in this discussion today, but we're going to focus on kinetic energy, and that's the energy of motion. So the energy of motion is energy that anything has when it's moving. And if you think about it, everything around us is moving because even at the molecular level, those atoms and molecules are vibrating. Now we can calculate kinetic energy. You may have done this in class. The formula for calculating kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared, or it might be easier if um, you use the equation this way, just divide by that two instead of multiplying by a half. It works either way, and your teachers may have given it to you in one of these two um, manners. But what's important to know about kinetic energy is when something has a change in the amount of energy it has, what's going to change about that piece of matter? Is it going to be its mass, or is it going to be its velocity? Which of those things are changeable variables? Right. It's the velocity. The mass of an object isn't going to change, but the velocity will. So velocity is just a fancy word for speed. So if the particles speed up, they're gonna have more kinetic energy. If the particles slow down, they'll have less kinetic energy because we must assume that the law of conservation of mass dictates that the mass is gonna be conserved for whatever the particle is. Okay, so let's look at how potential and kinetic energy work together to obey the law of conservation of energy. And I have a typo 
on my slide. I don't know if you see it there. This should read not matter, but energy is never created or destroyed, but it's only transformed or changed into a different form of energy. So our best example, most fun example of this is if we look at a roller coaster and you go up to the very tippy top of that very first hill, it's really slow, you know, all the suspense building up. And a lot of times they'll stop you right at the top. You're looking over that hill and you're anticipating the drop. And at that moment that you're at the top of the hill, your kinetic energy, because your speed is zero, you're stopped. So your kinetic energy is going to be zero, but you're way up above the earth. So you have lots of gravitational potential energy. And then the roller coaster loses its hold and you end up plummeting down the hill. And as you do that pretty quickly, you pick up speed. And so your speed increases, and as your speed increases, your kinetic energy is going to increase. But what's happening to your potential energy? As you move closer to the ground here, that distance between you and the uh, ground is decreasing. So while your speed is increasing and your kinetic energy is getting larger, your potential energy is decreasing. But look at this. As the kinetic energy increases and the potential energy decreases, the amount, the total amount of energy stays the same. If this was, and we'd be measuring energy in joules, of course. So if um, we added the two together, we'd end up with 100 joules of energy. Look, that's the same that we had to begin with. We didn't lose any. We just converted some of our potential energy into kinetic energy as we started to move closer to the earth. Then at the bottom of the hill, that's when we're traveling the fastest because we've been falling for the greatest amount of time. And at the very bottom of the hill, all of our energy was converted to kinetic energy. And since we're at the bottom of our hill, we have absolutely no potential energy. It's all been converted to potential energy. So we're gonna have, we're gonna be going really fast. We're gonna have a high speed, high kinetic energy, but low potential energy. And then what happens? Well, we're gonna coast back up the next hill. And as we're coasting, remember gravity is still pulling down on us, so we'll be slowing down. And as we slow down, our kinetic energy is going to decrease, but we're moving farther away from the Earth, so our potential energy increases. But guess what? Our total energy is still the same energy was conserved okay you might have looked at this same kind of energy conversion uh, using a pendulum or a swing where our maximum potential energy is here at the highest point of the swing and as we move through the swing we increase our speed till we get to the maximum kinetic energy and the lowest potential energy and so we see that conversion again of kinetic energy to potential energy, but the amount remains constant. So as we're moving through this swing, kinetic energy increases, potential energy decreases, and then the opposite happens. At the top, when we make our little stop, kinetic energy is at a minimum and potential energy is at a maximum. So um, we're always gonna see energy con uh, conserved in this way. But what about at the molecular level. What's going on when we have some kind of a chemical reaction like burning going on? How is energy conserved there? What's going on with those particles? And that's really what we need to look at today is what's going on at the particulate level. And to understand that, we're gonna look at another theory and that's called kinetic molecular theory. If you've already studied solid liquids and gases, you've probably already heard or talked about kinetic molecular theory. And that theory says that all matter is made up of tiny particles. And these tiny particles will be molecules or atoms. And the thing is, they're in constant motion. Even if you look at your desk in front of you, the molecules inside your desk are vibrating back and forth. It's almost like the bonds that are holding the particles together are. Um, 
they're vibrating. And so the molecules can move closer together and farther apart. They can vibrate up and down, but they're still vibrating in place, even if it's a solid. And then in a liquid, of course, that vibration becomes like sliding past each other and actually moving positions relative to each other. And then finally in a gas, we've added so much energy to the system that these bonds or possibly just forces are broken and now they're moving independent and completely disassociated from each other. But when we're thinking about these, this constant motion, we know that every once in a while they bump into each other. And we call this bumping into each other a collision. And we assume that these collisions will always be elastic, okay? Now, if you've talked about bonding, you might be thinking to yourself, but wait a minute, what if a bond forms? We're not talking about bonding right now. We're just looking at collisions between particles that are not bonded, okay? Okay. So let's look at this collision that we just talked about and think about the conversion of that kinetic energy of the moving particle. How is that converted or transferred maybe to another particle that doesn't have as much energy? So here I have two particles. Um, we're going to say that the orange one here is moving at a faster rate or a faster speed than the blue one. And even though they're different colors, they're the same, let's assume they're the same type of particle. Um, just let's pretend they're a helium atom, okay? So we have this one atom moving um, so that it has kinetic energy of 20 joules, and it smacks into this slow-moving particle that only has an energy of two joules. What happens during this collision is part of the energy from the fast moving particle is transferred to the slow moving particle. And that results in our fast moving particle now is moving a little bit slower. It has a little bit en less energy. Look, it's only 15 joules, where our slow moving particle has absorbed some of the energy and now it has seven joules of energy. So it's sped up and it's gained some energy. If you think about what happens when you're playing, if you've ever played pool and balls smack into each other, one's traveling fast and it hits a ball that's stationary and that one goes off in another direction, or maybe um, you played marbles or bowling, when the bowling ball hits the pins, it's the same kind of idea that an elastic collision occurs, gives energy to whatever it smacks into, and now our new particle has energy. So energy is conserved even at the molecular level. So how do we measure the energy at the molecular level? What's going on there? Um, it's going to be really difficult to get into matter and measure its energy. We don't have any way of going in and saying, okay, what's the energy of that particle? What's the energy of this particle? And like writing them all down for every single particle, because if you remember the number of atoms or molecules in a sample, even a really small sample of matter, is astronomical. Um, one mole of material has one times 10 to the, to the 23rd particles in it. So there's no way to practically measure the energy of each particle. So what we have to do is we have to take the average. And when we take the average, we're really taking the temperature of this sample of matter. And that's our definition of temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy in a sample of matter. So we can't measure each particle, but we can get an average of the particles. And since we're measuring energy, it's very useful to use something called the Kelvin scale for measuring this energy, because it is possible for our energy to be zero. And our energy isn't going to be zero at the freezing point of water. 
even chunks of ice that are solid, those particles are still moving. Those ice molecules are still vibrating around. And you can actually have ice at different temperatures. Um, so we have to use a different scale when we're looking at energy. And that scale is called the Kelvin scale. And the Kelvin scale actually takes us all the way to zero energy, the place at which the particle motion and the kinetic energy are going to be zero. All motion is going to stop at this point. Now, is that a real temperature or is that something that we could do in our laboratory? Mm, not really. This is what we call a theoretical um, a theoretical temperature. Now, I will say that in the lab, in not well, not my lab, but in very sophisticated labs, they've gotten really close to absolute zero, but they still haven't figured out how to completely freeze, pardon the pun, completely stop all of the motion. So we're close and we're just not quite there yet. But theoretically, we could stop the motion of these particles. So the Celsius scale, because of this, the Celsius scale is insufficient. The Celsius scale, like we were saying before, is based on the freezing point of water. And we know there's lots of things that have temperatures that are below the freezing point of water. Um, dry ice, for example, is way below the freezing point of water. And so the Kelvin scale becomes a useful tool for us to measure temperatures, energy of samples of matter that have negative values. Because some of the calculations we want to do, if we had a ne negative value in it, would give us erroneous data that, that didn't make sense. Now, there's one other scale on here that we haven't really talked about, and that's the Fahrenheit scale. Um, that's um, also based on the freezing point of water, but when Fahrenheit developed this scale, he actually took um, some salt and put his thermometer down in freezing salt water. And so the temperature was lowered, the freezing point of ice was lowered to 32. And he did that so that he would have a larger range on his thermometer. But the thing is, Fahrenheit is one of those scales that's not based on tens. It's not considered a metric scale or SI units. And so we don't really use that very much in science. The two scales that we want to use are going to be Celsius and Kelvin. But we have to convert between these numbers occasionally to do our Kelvin calculations. So to convert between Celsius and Kelvin, if we would want to convert a Celsius temperature to a Kelvin temperature, we're just going to add 273. And to go the other way, we'll subtract. So what would that look like? Let's say I wanted to figure out what the boiling point of water was in Kelvin. And, I, and let's pretend like I didn't have this thermometer to look at. Okay, so if I knew that the boiling point of water was 100 degrees Celsius, I would just add 273, and that would give me the boiling point of water is 373 Kelvin. Notice I did not put a degree sign on that Kelvin. We don't say degrees Kelvin, we just say Kelvins, okay? And of course, if I wanted to convert Kelvin back to Celsius, I would just subtract that 273. It's kind of like Celsius has been given a little bit of a head start, a 273 degree head start to zero. So just to get to Kelvin, we just have to back it up to zero and subtract. Okay, so one other thing that I kind of want to make sure you understand that even though Celsius starts at a different place on our thermometer than Kelvin does, the size of a Kelvin degree, the amount of energy in one degree Kelvin or one step on the Kelvin scale is the same as a degree Celsius. It's just at a different starting place on the scale. So let's take a look at that. Let's say that we had something if I get this to move. Mm. 
let's say we had something at the freezing point, okay? We have some ice. And so we're right here, just to go, we're right here on our Kelvin and our Celsius thermometer. So I have a piece of ice and it's at zero degrees, it's freezing. And let's say I melt that ice and then I heat it up to 10 degrees. Okay, so I've increased the temperature of my ice by 10 degrees. So I'm at 10 degrees Celsius. How would I convert that to Kelvin? Ah, I'm going to add 273, and that's going to give me a Kelvin of 283 degrees. I shouldn't say degrees, just 283 Kelvin. Well, let's look at our thermometers here. If we look on the thermometer, that's the same increment. We traveled the same distance on the thermometer to get from 273 to 283 Kelvin as we did zero to 10 Celsius. So it's the same size and that's important because that can save you time a little bit later on when we start doing calculations with our Kelvin and Celsius degrees, if we have changes, we're not going to have to convert between them because the size of a change is going to be the same. And that'll make a little bit more sense here in a minute when we start doing some calculations. So in a nutshell, remember, temperature is the average kinetic energy in a sample of matter. But that doesn't tell us about the total amount of energy in a sample. We have another term that we use to talk about the total amount of energy in a sample, and that's called a sample's thermal energy. So thermal energy is the amount of energy that a sample possesses as a result of its molecular kinetic energy, as a result of all the bumping and vibrating of those molecules within this piece of matter, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. But to accurately measure it, like we said before, that's going to be a tough job because we'd have to know what the energy of each particle is. Now, there is a way that we can estimate it, and this would be um, one of the equations that we could use. But you know what? That's not very useful. The average temperature is usually going to get us exactly what we need. What we're more interested in when we're talking about thermal energy is the transfer of thermal energy. So there's three terms that we need to make sure we can distinguish between. We need to make sure we know the difference between temperature, between thermal energy, and a new term that we haven't talked about yet, and that is heat. So we have two systems here. We're gonna assume that system one, because it's bright red, is um, hot. And we're going to assume that this blue one over here is what we would say is cold. So it's at a lower temperature. So system one has high energy. It's, um, it contains energy, but it doesn't contain what we would call heat. Heat is when we transfer energy from one place to another. Now, you may not use that term in your everyday language, but it's important for scientists to distinguish between the terms they're using. And so the term heat to a scientist is talking about transferring thermal energy from one place to another. Also notice that it's going to be transferred from a warmer system to a colder system or a sim system at a high temperature, I'll get this right in a minute, to a system of low temperature. So temperature is a measure of the average thermal energy in a sample, and heat is that energy being transferred from one place to another, and it's always transferred from high to low. Okay. So what are the important things that you need to know about this idea of heat? Again, heat is transferred energy, okay? When we say we feel something is hot or cold, we're talking about we're feeling heat being transferred to or from our hand. So if we look at system one here, 
and this was our hand. Let's pretend system one is our hand. And we were touching something that was cooler than our hand. If we said it was cold, we would be feeling that energy moving to a system that had lower energy. And if we changed that up and we said, okay, let's pretend our hand is this cold thing over here. And we were touching something that was hot, we would feel the energy being transferred into our hand. And we would say, oh, that thing is hot. Heat always flows from an area of high energy to low energy, okay? And one more thing, there is no such thing as cold, okay? Cold is not what we transfer. We transfer energy and we either feel it as hot if it's being transferred into our hand or maybe it's our thermometer or we feel it as cold if it's being transferred away. We can calculate the amount of heat in our transfer. And we can use this equation right here to calculate it. Thermal energy, remember that's what we're transferring in the form of heat is equal to the specific heat of the substance we're being transferred to times the mass times the temperature change. So let's talk about this idea real quick of thermal, of specific heat. So specific heat is just a value that describes a substance's ability to conduct heat. And here I have a table that has the values of specific heats of some common substances. You should recognize all of these things. So if you notice water has a very high specific heat, well, copper, on the other hand, has a very low specific heat. So what does that mean? Well, if it's a good conductor, it's gonna have a low specific heat, meaning that it can transfer energy very efficiently in and out of this substance. If it's a poor conductor, it's gonna have a high specific heat, meaning that it's gonna take a whole lot of energy to raise the temperature of that material in the appreciable amount. And we call these poor conductors, they have another name that's um, called insulators. Okay, and if you think about it, why do you insulate things? Well, you insulate things like your refrigerator or maybe your sleeping bag or your house because you don't want heat either to escape or to get into it. Now, hang on just a minute. Think about what we were, we've been talking about. We've been talking about the fact that there's no such thing as cold. So if I have an ice chest, let's say, and I want it to be cold on the inside, that means I have an absence of heat, right, on the inside. I'm not trying to keep cold in. I'm trying to keep heat out, right? So that's how we're insulating it. We're not trying to keep the cold in. The higher the number of a specific heat, the more ma a material is going to resist a change in temperature. So let's try some of these calculations here. How much energy is needed to increase the temperature of 755 grams of iron from 283 Kelvin to 403 Kelvin? So the first thing we're going to need to do is identify our Q, C, M, and delta T. So how much energy? Q is a measure of energy. So we're going to be solving for Q. The temperature, um, we we're going to increase the temperature of 755 grams of iron. So that's our mass. And this is our temperature change right here. We're missing C, however, our specific heat. But if you'll remember, Back on this page over here, we have a table of specific heats. And if we look through it, we'll find iron. Now you may have a page that your teacher has given you, or you may have a list of these in the back of your book. But when you get a problem like this, look around and those specific heats should be given to you. It's not something that you're gonna have to memorize. I don't know, your teacher might ask you to memorize water, but the rest of these are gonna be on a table. So we have 449 
look at the units. Units are very important. Joules per kilogram Kelvin. So let's write that down over here on our problem page. 449 joules per kilogram Kelvin. So we've got 449 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Make that nice and big so it looks like a Kelvin. So let's plug these things into our equation. We have 449. Oops. To do a little bit of erasing here. Joules per kilogram Kelvin times our mass, which is 755 grams. Uh oh. I see a problem. I have 755 grams, and I know I'm going to want to cancel my grams with my kilograms to get my mass out of this equation and end up just with joules, because remember, energy is measured in joules. So what I really need to put in my equation is put this value in in kilograms. So there are 1,000 kilograms for every gram. So if I divide that by 1,000, I'm going to end up with 755 kilograms. If you're not sure how I did that, you need to go back and review your methods for converting uh, metric, between metric uh, values, okay? All right, so I've got my specific heat, I've got my mass, and now I need to do my change in temperature. And they've given it to me right here. Now remember that sign delta is how you say it, that sine delta means change in. And we always want to calculate our deltas as the final minus the initial. Okay, so my final temperature is going to be 403 Kelvin, and my initial temperature was 283 Kelvin. This is important because we're trying to see what the change is, and a change is always going to be where did we start minus where we ended up. If you get those flipped, you'll have the wrong sign. You may have a negative where you need a positive. And if you get the wrong sign, that's going to give you the wrong sign on your energy, and it's going to tell a completely false story about what happened. So make sure that you always do final minus initial. So here we have 403 minus 283, which is going to give me an answer of uh, 120 Kelvin. And I did that separately because if I please excuse my dear Aunt Sally or PEMDAS, I know I have to do my addition and subtraction before I do my multiplication. So um, before I go ahead and calculate my final answer, I'm going to go through and um, cancel my units to make sure I have this all set up correctly. So we've already taken care of the kilograms here. I can cancel kilograms with kilograms because it's on the bottom. This one's on the top. I've got my kelvins here, which these are actually on the top, and this one is on the bottom of my term. So I can cancel my kelvin with my 120 kelvin, and I'm left with a unit of joules. Okay. So joules are what energy are measured in, so it looks like I am on the right track. Now if I do my multiplication, I'm going to have 449 times 0.755 times 120. I'm going to put that in the calculator real quick. So 120 times 0 0.755 times 449 gives me 330. 39 joules, if I did all of that right. So that's how much energy is needed to increase this sample of iron by 120 degrees, okay? Let's do another little practice here. Identify an unknown substance with a mass of 0.445 kilograms that absorbs 6.33 times, and that is another thing, this did not transfer in here very well, that should say 6.33 times 10 to the third joules of energy, 
okay, in which a temperature change of 15.5 degrees Celsius is observed. So now they want us, what, to identify an unknown substance? Well, let's look back um, a couple of slides here at this table. And remember, on this table, every substance had its own specific heat. And we can actually, in many cases, identify a substance by its specific heat. So if we could calculate the specific heat, we can go back and maybe identify our substance based on that table. So let's go back over here to our problem. And how would we calculate specific heat? Well, we're going to want to factor mass and change in temperature out of this equation. And if I multiply or divide both sides by mass and change in temperature, that means my new equation is going to be Q over M times delta T is going to equal my specific heat. I was given the amount of energy, which is 6.33 times 10 to the minus third. Oh, not to the minus third, to the third joules. And my mass was given to me in kilograms this time, so I don't have to do a conversion. And my temperature change. Now it's given to me in Celsius, but remember we said that since a degree Celsius and a degree Kelvin are the same size, we don't have to do any temperature conversion here. So that's going to be 15.5, and I'm just going to leave it like that because degrees Celsius and degrees Kelvin are the same thing. So let's plug this into our calculator, 6.33. Hopefully you're doing second E to the third to put it in your calculator correctly. Um, divided by 4.55 uh, divided by 15.5 is going to give us a number of 897.55. Uh, Ooh, that doesn't look like what I want it to. Uh, let's try that again. 897.55, and it goes on and on and on. And we'll talk about significant figures in another video as well. But we've got joules. I didn't write this in, but those are going to be kilograms. And I left off our temperature, but it could be Celsius or Kelvin. So I'll try to squeeze that Kelvin in right there. Okay, there's our number. 897.55. So let's go back to that table on the other page. I'm going to have to clear this and march back over there. And do we see anything that has a specific heat that's close to 890? Oh, there we go, 897. So it appears that we had aluminum in our last problem. Okay. There's other types of problems that we could solve. I don't think we're going to have time to do um, my last example, but I'll go ahead and show it to you if you want to write it down real quick. What is the temperature change that would, uh, what temperature change, excuse me, would copper experience under the same conditions as those observed if I had the same mass and energy as in the last problem? So now they want us to solve for temperature change so we can do the same trick of factoring out specific heat and mass. So our new equation would look like Q is uh, divided by specific heat and mass will equal our temperature change. I will have to go look up on a table similar to the one we have. We'll have to find the specific heat of iron, right? No, copper, copper on the table. And then we just multiply and divide the same as we did before. Um, we'd have to use our Q from the problem that we did before to be able to answer this one. I'm gonna go ahead and work that out because there's a couple of other things that we need to talk about before I let you all go. And those are methods of heat transfer. So I'm gonna go through these really quick. You're gonna to wanna to study your vocabulary to make sure that you can tell these guys apart. So the first one is conduction. 
And we've kind of been talking about conduction all along here. Conduction is when we have thermal energy travel through a material as the particles collide into one another. So if we've got conduction going on, that means that the particles have to be in contact with each other. So if I was to heat up, say, a rod of metal and stick it in the fire, I know that the heat is going to be traveling down the stick and eventually it's going to get hot in my hand and I'm going to drop it and say, ouch. Well, what's happening on the molecular level is all of the particles start vibrating and they bump into their neighbors here and they bump into their neighbors here and eventually those vibrations, that energy is transferred or conducted all the way through the material. Another method of heat transfer is convection. You may have heard of convection currents when you studied earth science in the atmosphere or down in the mantle of the earth. So convection results from the literal moving of matter, okay? We have matter moving from one place to another and it's only gonna occur in fluids where we have a mixing of hot and cold fluids. Now remember, when matter is heated, it's going to expand. And when matter expands, that causes it to become less dense. So let's take a side trip real quick and review density. Remember, density is equal to mass divided by volume. So if we just look at what's going on in a balloon, we have the same number of particles in each picture, but as we increase the temperature, as we heat up the gas, those particles gain energy and they start moving apart and they have more force and they can expand. So what's happening is the volume of our sample of matter here increases, but remember conservation of mass says the mass is gonna stay the same. That gas can't escape from the balloon. So if we have our number on the bottom, if we have our number on the bottom increasing, our volume gets larger, but the mass stays the same, what's gonna to happen to density? The density is gonna decrease, right? And if the density decreases, we can have this mass of air this becomes less dense, and we know that in the atmosphere or in fluids, things that are less dense rise to the top, and things that are more dense are going to sink to the bottom. And so this idea of mixing occurs as things rise to the top. Here's an example with boiling water. The warm water is going to rise to the top of the pan where it's going to cool off, and then it's going to get more dense and it's going to sink. So we get this convective. Um, heating and cooling, and those are called convection currents. My favorite example of convection currents can be seen in a lava lamp. So if you've ever watched a lava lamp, you know that down here at the bottom, the thick oily substance gets warm because there's a light bulb right here, and it gets warm and its density decreases and it floats to the top. Well, up here, it's cool, and so the the oil cools off and it gets more dense and then it sinks to the bottom and then it warms up and it goes to the top so you have this beautiful motion of the oil getting less dense it rises to the top cools down and sinks to the bottom and so you have a great example of uh, convection currents there the last method of heat transfer is radiation and radiation is where we have energy transferred as an electromagnetic wave. Now, I'm not sure how much you guys have studied about electromagnetic waves or EM radiation for short, but it doesn't require any contact with anything. This is pure energy traveling through space. And this is how all of the energy that we receive on Earth gets to our planet because it all comes from the sun. It could be visible, it could be invisible. Infrared and ultraviolet light are not visible to our eyes, but they have lots of energy in them. In fact, um, infrared light is how we feel most of our heat that's radiated from flames or the sun. What we would call, ooh, it feels really warm out here today. We'd be feeling that infrared radiation. Um, it can be absorbed and reflected. 
So we know that dark colors will absorb this energy a lot better than light colors will because light colors will reflect it. And this is, um, this radiation from the sun is what drives our atmosphere. And once it comes down here to the earth, we have heating and then um, we start getting these convective currents. And so our um, weather is driven by this radiation and convection working together. Now there's one last point that I wanna make and we're using a word radiation, but we do not mean nuclear radiation. For those of you who have uh, talked about alpha particles and beta particles, we're not talking about something um, that's coming from the nucleus of a cell. Yes, yes, I know fusion is going on in the sun, but we're not talking about nuclear radiation. This is just pure radiation of electromagnetic waves coming through the atmosphere. Okay. Cannot get this. There we go. <laughs> okay. I am not sure how much time we have, but um, I would like to do a few practice problems before we uh, get going. So uh, let's look at some of these. You might see these on a um, very noisy clock tells me we're almost out of time. Um, you may see some of these things on a standardized test or they may be kind of like the problems that you're working in class. So let's go. What happens to energy that is lost when an engine is less than 100% efficient? So that just means that it doesn't appear that the law of conservation of energy is being obeyed. Number one, it's destroyed during combustion. Well, we know that energy is never destroyed, so that can't be the answer. It's converted to heat and transferred to the environment. Hmm, that could be. It's converted to matter in the form of gases. Do we convert matter to energy in engines? No, that's something that happens in nuclear reactions, not in engines. Or it's lost as friction between the tires of the vehicle and the surface of the road. Well, it is true that some of the energy that is generated by the engine is lost to friction, but first it has to be transferred all the way through the drive system to the tires. So the most direct and the most correct answer is going to be that it's converted to heat and transferred to the environment. Think about the radiator and the coolant and all of the things that are in the engine that help keep it cool. Read this question. What change occurs and matters when its temperature is increased? The specific heat is a constant. The specific heat is not going to change for a material unless we actually change the material itself. Atoms and molecule and material move faster. Hmm. If I add heat, if I increase temperature, I've increased kinetic energy, right? And if I've increased kinetic energy, I've increased the velocity or the speed. I'm going to write VEL so you don't think I'm in volume. So, um, yeah, that's true, but we never stop. We want to read all of our choices. The attraction between the atoms and the molecules increases. Well, we know this isn't true because we know as this velocity increases, as the particles gain their own kinetic energy, they vibrate and they pull apart more. They move apart from each other. So that attraction decreases. And the frequency of collision between the atoms decreases. No, if I'm moving more quickly, I'm gonna be able to smack into a lot more things than if I'm moving slowly. So G is gonna be the best answer here. Which transfer method carries energy from the sun to the earth? Well, we just talked about this. Right, radiation. What is the temperature of hot chocolate decrease faster if you place a metal spoon in the liquid? And we're gonna assume that this metal spoon is cooler than the liquid. What do we know happens with heat or thermal energy? It always flows from an area of high energy. So this we'd say hot chocolate 
to an energy, an area of low energy. So the heat is going to flow from the hot chocolate into the cool spoon. And if energy is moving from this area to this er area, that means that the energy has to decrease here for it to increase here, right? Law of conservation of energy. If I take from one place, I have to give to another. So the spoon heats up and the hot chocolate cools down. You should practice writing responses to questions like this. Here's one, I love that picture. Determine why you can't cool your kitchen on a hot day by opening the refrigerator to let the cold air escape into the room. Hmm, how does a refrigerator work? Well, a refrigerator, just like an ice chest, all it's gonna do is keep the hot air out. And it also has the added feature that it can pump any warm air out. So have you ever stood in front of the refrigerator and right down here at the bottom, you can feel warm air coming out from under the refrigerator. So that's the refrigerator pumping this warm air out. Well, where's it pumping it to? The kitchen. So there's no way you're gonna be able to use the refrigerator to cool the kitchen because all it would do is pump the warm air back in and right back out. So it may feel cool for a few minutes while the cool air moves into the kitchen, but eventually you're not gonna get a removal of energy from your kitchen to um, another place. It'll just circulate the air. So again, mom will just be saying, don't stand there with a the kitchen with the refrigerator door open. Let's take a look at this question. The specific heat of water is very high compared to that of the soil and rock that makes up the land surfaces. In areas near a large body of water, the water does not heat as quickly as the land during the summer and does not cool as quickly as the land during the winter. This causes the climate in coastal areas to be generally milder than inland areas at the same latitude. For example, San Francisco has cooler summers and warmer winters than Sacramento, which is 150 kilometers to the east or inland, not near the water or the ocean. How does the specific heat of water affect the ability to moderate coastal temperatures? So you have to put together lots of information to be able to answer this. But the reason that it relates to our discussion of heat is because we're talking about transfer. So if I have air masses, I'm trying to make little air particles here. And the blue, we're going to pretend, is um, water. So I've got these particles of air and I have particles of water. And remember, we said that we're always going to transfer from an area of high energy to low energy. So in the summer, if the water is cool, that means in the air is warm. That means that the warm air can actually transfer its energy to this body of water. And that will make the warm air cool off. If we look at the reverse, where in the winter time, the water is warmer because remember, it's gonna resist the change in temperature and the air is cool. The warm water can transfer energy to the air. Now I'm gonna let you practice writing a paragraph and putting that into your own words, but the things that your answer is gonna to need to have in it is it's gonna to need to talk about the specific heat of water and that water does not change temperature, and it's gonna to need to talk about this transfer of uh, heat from water to air or air to water in the different seasons. So if this was an open response or a free response writing, you would need to make sure that you mention all of those things in your answer. Here's one more. What form of heat transfer is represented by this illustration? Mm. What part of the picture do you think they're talking about? Yeah, they're talking about this part right here. I know some of you may be looking at that fire and go, ooh, radiation. 
but they're specifically talking about those arrows there. And notice um, you've got, you can see that it's mixing, that the warm air is rising and cooling. So what would that be? Yeah, that's an example of convection, of mixing these fluids, the air together. So don't be fooled by that one. Radiation's tempting because you see fire, but if they only wanted you to look at the radiation, they probably would have just given you a picture of fire. So best answer, not just correct answer. And here's our last practice. Two beakers are each filled with 10 ice cubes. A small amount of boiling water is poured into beaker A and a large amount of boiling water at the same temperature is poured into beaker B. Only three of the ice cubes in beaker A melt, while all 10 of the cubes in beaker B melt. Since the water was at the same temperature, why did the same number of ice cubes melt in each beaker? Hmm. Let's think about this. There's an equation that we talked about before that can help you answer this question. And that's this idea that mass plays a role in how much energy is transferred and how much that energy transferred will affect the temperature, okay? So in beaker A, we had a lot of water. So a lot of water means we'd have a large mass where all of these things were going to be the same. And in beaker B, we had a small amount of water. Okay, to do beaker A melt. And, oh, did I say that? I said that backward. We have a small amount of water in beaker A and a large amount of water in beaker B. So more energy can be transferred to the ice from a large amount of water than at in a small from a small amount of water. Even though they're at the same temperature, the amount of thermal energy, I'm going to abbreviate it, TE, contained, I don't know why I'm making all of my ends like M's today, contained, why is my pen not working? in beaker A is greater than beaker B, okay? I would want you to put that in a little bit better paragraph form, but those are the things that you're gonna need to talk about, okay? Okay, so I think that we are finished with our discussion. I hope that some of these problems um, are like the ones you're working in class and that everything made sense. If not, you need to go back to your book and you need to really look at those definitions because a lot of this stuff is just definition that you need to um, make sure you know, okay? All right, I'm gonna sign off. If I can get this to go back where it needs to, I don't think I can. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk to you next time.